Go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We have been in our Unshaken series now for several months. And uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, we finished our, our study through 1 Thessalonians. And the idea of the Unshaken series is, is that for many of us, we are in, 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 a, in a time where things are more antagonistic towards Christianity, as we know and as we can see. And the Bible says that would happen. The days would wax worse and worse. So we're not to, to be fearful or anything like that or to be going, what is going on? I didn't know this was going to happen. At the same time, I think sometimes it shakes us to our core. Sometimes Christians can kind of start to pull back and not be as passionate or tenacious about the things of the Lord. And, and I think it was important to jump into this series and see this young church that Paul had planted about a year before he wrote 1 Thessalonians. And, and he was really helping them navigate this terrain because they were a little shaken about persecution and issues that they were going through and a little shaken about maybe those that had passed on before them and what was going to happen to them. Some great questions from some young Christians, but even in those questions, they were a model church, a growing community, a people that were passionate about the things of God, that were loving other people and seeing the gospel reign supreme. And so Paul would write 1 Thessalonians and really detail a lot of these different topics along the way. And if you weren't here for those, you can go back on our YouTube channel and kind of hear them out. I promise you there'll be a blessing because the word of God never returns void. But today we're going to walk into first th- uh, to Second Thessalonians, and Paul's going to begin to write this letter again. And, and from what our understanding is as far as history goes, he's at the church of Corinth at this time. About three months have passed since he wrote the first Thessalonians, and he's writing the second letter to them. And he's penning some pretty powerful words here yet again. And here in this first four verses this morning, he's going to detail some things for them. And here's the truth of the matter. They're going through some hard times. They're dealing with some difficulties. They are just having a hard go of it. But they're living intentional. The gospel is still working. Their love for others is still growing. Their faith in Jesus is getting deeper. Their patience, their maturity in Christ is growing. And he's going to write this. And really the thought behind this morning is he's going to tell them, look, you truly are making the best of it. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word, if, if you're physically able. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul and Silvanus, this would be Silas, and Timotheus, or Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, Paul often did this at the beginning of one of his letters, grace and peace. And we've talked about this in the past, but you can't have peace without God's grace. And he talks about that because of the grace of God that has been bestowed on you that you have readily accepted through Jesus Christ, you now experience peace. So he can give this kind of quick thought right at the beginning, grace and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves Glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you bless the service and bring honor and glory to you. Help us, Lord, to apply its rich truths to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, have you ever been just kind of in a difficult situation and it's just kind of beating you up? Maybe it's something pretty small. I remember when uh, my family and I were uh, uh, meeting Hillcrest for the first time a little over two years ago, and we had come out for a meet and greet to get to know the people, meet the pulpit committee and all of that. It was a great time. It was kind of a whirlwind weekend for us. We flew in on a Friday. We flew out on a Sunday night. We had to get back because my daughter had school on Monday. It was just a lot going on. I was was knee deep into a full-time job as an assistant pastor, plus I was doing full-time credits for my Master of Divinity, plus I was candidating at a church, and my wife's looking at me like, what are you doing? Doing, you know, it's just a lot going on. Well, that was a great time of meeting the church. And then about a month later, a month and a half later or so, we came back out again and I was getting everything ready and all of that. And we were just kind of, it was just again, a whirlwind. We just kind of, there's a lot going on during that week leading up to it. And uh, we got everything, we got everything packed, we got everything loaded up and we drove over to the airport to kind of get on our plane. And as I start pulling out bags out of the trunk, I realized something really quick. One of my bags wasn't there. And it was the bag that had all of my dress clothes. So all I had was jeans and t-shirts and all of that. And I wanted to make a great impression for the church. And so I began to really get scared. 
And I remember turning to my wife and said, what am I going to do? And she looks at me and she goes, well, what we can do, let's get on the plane and we'll figure it out. You know, there's nothing else you can do at this time. We got on the plane, we got here, we flew in on a, on a Friday night, and on Saturday, I drove over to the Ontario Mills Mall, and I began looking for suits or dress pants, a dress shirt, something like that that I can find. And if you've looked for those things, they're not always readily available. They might have it in a really large size or in a really small size, but really do you find your size, you know, when you go to those things. So I began looking, and I was really scared, and my parents came out, and they were here just kind of supporting us through all of this, but something my wife helped me do in this really small thing was just make the best of it. Look, it might be something that's giving you a little bit of pause and, and a little scare, that you're a little scared right now, but let's make the best of it, and let's do the best that we can with it. Now, that's a really small thing, but maybe today, if I were to ask you this, what are you going through? You might be going through, tr- through some trauma right now. There might be this tribulation right now in your life that nobody knows about or very few people do. And it is something that is just weighing on you so heavily that you feel overwhelmed by it. If you can feel that emotion right now, that's what this young church was feeling. They were being persecuted people from the outside that were literally persecuting them. People were dying for the faith. Back then, as a Christian, if you became a Christian, it wasn't like how it is today in America where somebody gets saved and we all applaud. Back then, if they got saved, they could lose their job. They could lose their livelihood. They could lose their home. They could lose their family. They could be imprisoned. They could lose their life. So becoming a Christian was a big, big step. And because of that, they were getting persecuted heavily for it. There were tribulations, as the Bible says here, within people that were just creating havoc and stress and disturbing the pieces I'll talk about here in a minute. But Paul's going to start to navigate these truths. And if you remember, this church really started out of persecution. In Acts chapter 17, you see Paul get to the Thessalonica, which is about 100 miles from Philippi. He was there only for three weeks three weeks to plant a church. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to think, okay, if somebody's going to plant a church, you're thinking they're going to be there a little bit longer than three weeks, aren't you? He was there three weeks and persecution hit. They ran him out of town. And I'm sure he wondered what happened to that church. How are they doing? How are they doing? And he sent Timothy to go check on them. And after about a year or so, he hears, man, they're doing great. They're loving the Lord. They're growing even despite the issues and the problems and the trials and the tribulations. They are growing. But Timothy's going to come back. He's going to say, hey, after a few months after Paul sent that first letter to this young church, this young, vibrant church was singing a little bit of a different tune. Three months had passed from the first writing to the second. And as you heard from Timothy, they weren't changing their faith. They weren't stopping believing in God, but their persecution and their tribulation had gotten worse. It had become very insurmountable. It had become oppressing them and it was overwhelming them and things have gotten worse since Paul left. And I'm reminded of the phrase from Corey Ten Boom that, that says this, if God sends us on stony paths, he provides strong shoes. Corey Ten Boom went through a lot during the Holocaust. And she wrote that as a testimony to the goodness and grace of God, even in trials. So how does God do that? How does God give us stronger shoes to weather some stormy paths in our lives? How should we respond when our environment causes us extreme suffering? How should we react when others that we know and love are going through hard times and difficulty and extreme suffering? This book, 2 Thessalonians, answers those questions. And the first four verses give us that jump start. So in these first four verses that we've read, and that's kind of where we're going to take this morning, I've sort of divided up into really just three parts. And I'm going to give you different words for it, but this is the generalization of it. You have the good stuff, you have the bad stuff, you have the right stuff. There's good stuff, there's bad stuff, then there's right stuff. And Paul notes some of the good and positive things, but then he contrasts some of that to some of the, the bad stuff that was going on around their lives, because make no mistake, the world was broken then and it's still broken today. There's still issues, there's still problems, there's still insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable things in our lives, and he's going to speak about that. He's not going to dismiss it, pretend like everything is just fine. No, there was some hard stuff, there was some bad stuff, but this church, these young Christians, this young, vibrant, dynamic church met the opposition and the struggles with some pretty amazing things. 
So if you're taking notes, number one today, if you're gonna make the best of it, I want you to see what this church did. Their first thing is, I want you to see their development. Their development. Look at verse one through three. Really, we're gonna focus on verse three. Verse three says this, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity or love of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So first, their faith in God, and then second, their love for one another. That's the good stuff. <laughs> That's amazing stuff, by the way. In difficulty growing in these two areas, their faith was growing exceedingly. In other words, they trust God more now than they did before the trial. Their trust in God had grown deeper and it had cemented even more than before what they were going through. Going through. They had faith before, but now that faith is growing exceedingly. Do you remember um, McDonald's back in the day when I was a kid and teenager, they had a thing called supersize? You guys know what I'm talking about? Who misses that? I know I, know I shouldn't because it's not healthy for me, but when I go there, I don't want a small fry. I want a supersize fry, you know? I want to be, and you saw the drinks, you couldn't even fit them in your cup holder, right? They're so big, you're trying to, it's like a big gulp from 7-Eleven. It's just so big, you know, you do it. The idea here is that their faith was supersized during a trial. They had grown so much that they had gone from a steady faith to a growing, exceeding faith. Now, this is an interesting term that Paul uses, and I want to draw your attention to it. He talks about their faith growing exceedingly. So that idea of growing exceedingly, it's actually all one word in Greek. And it is a word that is used nowhere else in the New Testament except for this verse. By the way, I love to do that. I love to dig in and really investigate the passage because when you see something that's different than others, I want to know why, right? What does this mean? How can it bring something to our lives? I want you to get this. The idea here is that it means an unusual growth. The idea of above and beyond the normal limits. You might translate it as super-sized faith. Above normal limits for growth. Their faith in God, it was maturing and it was blossoming. You see, the storms they were facing did not uproot the tree of faith in their lives. As a matter of fact, it caused the roots of that tree to grow deeper and down and then to grow out exceedingly. You know, one of the keys to doing what's right when things go wrong is to be rooted in Jesus. Rooted, planted, cemented in Jesus. To get beyond superficial surface faith and have some roots in Jesus that when the storms do come and the winds do blow, you're in the right position because Jesus will never fail. He is unwavering. If you're out in an open field and you see a lightning storm coming your way, what do you do? Some of you are going, I don't know, let me Google it, you know. By the way, who felt the earthquake last night? Holy smokes. It was to me, okay? <laughs> that thing woke me up. I mean, man, that thing shook, and I remember <laughs> my wife and I were like, what was that? You know, that's like your heart's racing, right? And then you're like, it's three in the morning. Oh. You know, got to go back to sleep. I got to preach tomorrow. I got to preach this morning. I was like, my goodness, there's my kids. You know, you know what, Charles, they believe what you say. It was nothing to them. They just kept sleeping through it. I, I got to say, this has nothing to do with the message. So I, I remember when we were flying in, when we were candidating here and we were flying into Ontario and there was some turbulence. Who's been on a plane when there's some turbulence? Yeah, yeah. That's scary, right? No. No, it's not scary. You're like, well, it's a roller coaster, right? It's fun, you know? And we're going in, and there was some turbulence. And, you know, it wasn't enough for me to go, whoa, you know? But I, I won't lie. I was kind of sitting there going, you know, kind of gripping the, the, the handrail or the armrest a little bit. And going, Lord, please, please help us. Lord, please, please guide. Lord, please just, just let the pilot be really good. <laughs> and we're coming in, and this guy uh, next to us or near us, I mean, he was, he was struggling, he was struggling. He was kind of like, you know, like, you know, you know what I mean? Just those people that are just really scared. We came in for the landing and he comes up to me and he says, I just got to tell you, he goes, I was so scared when we were going through that turbulence that I saw your kids. And you know what my kids were doing? Woo! 
oh, let's do that again, you know? <laughs> and he said, I had no more fear. <laughs> I have no idea what that had to do with the message, but it's free for you, okay? So if you're out in an open field and you see a lightning storm coming your way, what do you do, man? We got to an earthquake, we got to turbulence. Let's get back to the message. Now, if you're out there, do you just kind of get on, on top of a hill and get as big as you can? Is that what you do? Now, people here, you're going, okay, that's, that's not smart, okay? We instinctively know that's not smart, right? What do you do? You try to get as small as you can, right? As a matter of fact, you get down to the earth, and they say kind of get down on your knees and kind of roll up into a ball. You want to get as small as you possibly can. You want to draw nearer to the earth, and this way it will attack something that is higher than you. I think that has a lot to do with the Christian life. What do you do during a time of storm in your life? Do you kind of stand up and go, man, I'm something, watch me? You don't do that, do you? When you're going through a hard time in a storm, you get down low. You get on your knees. You trust God harder. You grow deeper in that relationship with Jesus. Why? Because you know you can't solve it. You know that there is, there is a threat out there, but you know the God within and the Jesus that saved you is stronger than any threat you will ever face. J.I. Packer says this. He says, God uses chronic pain and weaknesses along with other afflictions as his chisel for sculpting our lives. Felt weakness deepens dependence on Christ for strength each day. So the weaker we feel, the harder we lean. And the harder we lean, the stronger we grow spiritually, even while our bodies waste away. We have a ministry at a at the Riverside Post-Acute Care Center. And um, D.C., where's D.C. at? D.C. leads that, and he goes out there two Sundays a month or so. And these people can't get out to go to church. They can't. And they're not physically able. It's a place of chronic pain. Um, a lot of times people are left there, and they're forgotten by their family. It's just, it's just what it is. The place is not overly nice. Um, you have good staff there, but it's difficult and all of that, and we try to have a ministry in there twice a month where we bring a service to them and love on them and show them that they matter and that they're valued by God. Can I tell you something? Some of the most robust spiritual Christians in the world are in that place. Their physical bodies, they have diseases, they have issues, they have problems. Some can't use their whole side because of a stroke. Others, they have a hard time seeing amnesia or uh, uh, Alzheimer's has set in, but some of the ro most robust spiritual Christians I've ever met are in that place. Why? Because even though they've been going through some hard times and they have some weaknesses in their body, they've allowed it to chisel out, if you will, allow God to paint a masterpiece in their life because it doesn't matter what their body looks like or what stage of life they're in. What matters is, is the vibrancy within and my relationship with Jesus Christ. You might say that faith will put God between you and your circumstances. And that's what they did ex exactly, this church. They increased in faith. But I want you to look also in the same verse, they abounded in love. Or as Paul puts it, the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now, these two things, faith and love, were things that Paul mentioned in his first letter to them. And he said, I I'm going to put you in love. And in his first letter to them, he talked about their labor of love and their work of faith and their patience of hope. And in that first letter, he said, I know you've got faith, but here's one of his prayers. A few months earlier, he said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one another or one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To you, I know you're loving, but my prayer for you is that you would overflow and abound in love for each other. Well, it seems like in those three months that his prayer has been answered. They were abounding in love. They had grown in their love for one another and word had gotten back to Paul the apostle who's in Corinth as he writes this letter that their trust in God is super abounding and their love for each other is also abounding or it's overflowing without. Now, before we move on, I want you to notice the order of that. Faith comes first, love comes second. Faith comes first, love comes second. That is always the order that I see it in the New Testament. Faith causes the result of love for each other. One of the tests, if you will, that a person has faith in Jesus is if they have love for other people. That's not a foreign New Testament concept. It's a very common one. The first word, superabounding, implies an internal or inward organic growth like a tree. 
The second, that abounding love is a diffusive or expansive character as the flooding or irrigating of land. So let me rephrase it and simplify it. Faith is the root, whereas you have love is the fruit. When your faith to God is anchored in Jesus Christ, a fruit of the Spirit that will exemplify is love. Isn't that what it says in Scripture? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. So look deeper. When you, when you notice somebody, and let's say you, you, you kind of look at this and you say, you look at somebody and you say, oh man, they just, they're just a loving person. They're just a loving person. I want you to look deeper. And what you'll find in that person is that person is rooted in faith. One causes the other. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John chapter 3. He said, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. 1 John 4, and this commandment have we, have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. So a principal earmark for a Christian is love and faith, which is growing, not stagnant, not static. Sometimes we talk of faith as if it's kind of a stagnant quality, right? Man, I just wish I had your faith. <laughs> Man, I wish I had your faith. I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll just keep the faith, friend. I'll, I'll just keep the faith. You see, faith ought to be growing and expanding and developing, and so should our love for each other. Now, I want you to pause for a moment. What is your faith like? You say, well, how can I know? What actions this past week did you did that, will, that, you, that you did or that you're doing that will matter for eternity? What did you do this past week that will matter for eternity? How's your faith? Has it reached a plateau? Perhaps you have maybe this thought. You haven't even internalized it, but now you're thinking of it. Been there, done that, heard that? Oh, I've heard all this stuff before, Pastor. It's just the Christian life. I'm good. Are you ever increasing? What about your love? Is your love abounding? John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Catch this. If ye have love one to another. You know what a disciple is? A committed follower of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. So how can we know that somebody's a committed follower of Jesus? They're all in for Jesus. They demonstrate love that is abounding towards others. So the good stuff, this young church was developing, increasing in their faith for each other and their faith toward God. But let's get to number two. Let's look at their difficulties. Let's look at their difficulties. Look at verse four. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, I want you to notice as we go on, Paul's going to mention some of the bad stuff. And that's just the reality of life. We could be doing a lot of good things, but we're going to deal with some bad things. And you might be wondering at this point, why did Paul write a letter so soon after the first letter? I mean, three months. That's not long after. After all, letters in those days were not easy commodities. You had to write them. You had to give them to somebody to walk or run across the country to deliver. There wasn't some postal system like we have today where you could just put a stamp on it and mail it and pray it gets there because they don't lose it. It was difficult. So why did Paul write a letter on the heels of the first one? He wrote it because he wanted to strengthen them. See, it seems that there's three groups of people that were in the church somehow. Somehow related to this church, which was disturbing their peace. And by the way, have you ever had your peace just disturbed by somebody? I mean, they just, <laughs> they're not somebody. They just, they just, they shake you. They hurt you. Their peace was disturbed. People can do that. People can disturb your peace. And in this case, there were outsiders as well as some insiders that were disturbing the peace in this young church. Now, they were to love everyone, and that's not always easy, is it? You know, I'm reminded of the cartoon and what Linus says to Charlie Brown. He says, I love mankind. It's the people I can't stand. You know, it's easy to generalize that, isn't it? Oh, I love all people. And then we name somebody specific and you're like, oh, I love them. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard. There's just some people that are difficult to get along with. There's some people that really challenge this in your life. Yes, Lord, I will love them. I will love them. And then the day goes by and you're like, Lord, I need help with loving them. It's not always easy. The first group that is mentioned under the heading of persecution in verse four, the word persecution here is a word that means the hostile action of enemies. It's hostile. They're enemies. These are outsiders. These were unbelievers who didn't like what was going on. 
And this new Christian work in the town of Thessalonica, they wanted to end it. So if you remember back in Acts chapter 17, you don't have to turn there, I'll explain it. There was a work that was started. Remember, how long was Paul there? I heard somebody say it. Charles, good job. Three weeks. He was there three weeks. And Paul preached, and some believed. It's awesome. But then there were those who didn't believe, and they were so ticked off. They were so mad at believers and the gospel trying to reign supreme in their city that they hired what the Bible says lewd fellows of the baser sort. Now, if you read that, you're like, what does that mean? Here, I'll tell you what it means. It's an old English way of saying some hostile evil men. That's what they were. They were evil, evil intent. They were hired to create havoc, to to try to stop the penetration of the gospel in this city. And they all attacked the house of Jason where the believers were meeting. There was persecution going on. In the first letter of the Thessalonians, Paul mentions this. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Meaning, hey, you're dealing with some pretty hard persecution where you're at. And you're not alone. There's others that are doing it. But I can see the similarities between the two. Now, Paul wrote the letter. He's been in Corinth in those three months and he gets news back. Hey, Paul, look, this church is doing well. They're growing. Their love is abounding. Their faith is increasing. But I want you to understand something. It's gotten worse there. There's some stiffer persecution than than what we saw when we originally started. It has escalated from that point. And so Paul begins to write this letter to strengthen them because of the persecutors he writes this letter. As a matter of fact, chapter one is focused on strengthening the church and giving them reasons as they go through the suffering in this trial. You know, they're just like normal people. Sometimes we read scripture and we think, man, these are all just like super Christians. (laughs) They're just like you and me. Could you imagine going through this and saying, okay, we're gonna live for God more. We're gonna deepen our faith. Our love is gonna grow more, man. And God's gonna bless that. And through that growing and and that development and all of that, you're getting more persecution from outside and going, God, Why? Why is this happening? Why would a God of love allow me to suffer this kind of cruel and insensitive treatment here? I'm trusting God. (laughs) I'm not gonna change that. My faith is stronger because of it. My love is abounding because of who he is. I'm a Christian, but these unbelievers, these outsiders are against us and it's hurting me. I want you to understand this. Jesus has given you and me a mandate. Mark 16, it says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and what? Preach the gospel to every creature. In case you haven't learned this yet, there are some people that don't like that message. They do not like the gospel. Some do not like it. They disagree with the statement that only Jesus saves. You carry out that mandate and some people will wince and they will react violently, sometimes hostily against Christians who preach the gospel. Look, we do get some persecution here in America. We are a blessed nation. We do have some beautiful freedoms, okay? We do. We do get some persecution here, and I'm not trying to minimize the fact that being a Christian here will incur some amount of persecution, but can we be honest for a moment and just admit, it's not like what it really could be, is it? It's not like what it was in the early church, that's for sure. They were killed for the faith. It's not like what it is in many other countries. You know, I want to inform you that there are still places around the world where you have brothers and sisters that are related spiritually to you right now who are suffering at the hands of persecutors. A few weeks ago, I found out a guy I went to college with, his dad uh, was in Mexico and his dad's a missionary there and there was some sort of uh, funeral that was going on. It was very public and there was a family there that wanted some comfort and they had reached and extended out to this missionary man to come up to him and the, the man began to pray with them and really talk to them about Jesus and give them the gospel and the, uh, the priests that were there became very belligerent and, and told them to stop and tried to disperse the matter and they finished the prayer with them and, and had done what, they, they, what the family had asked them to do and kind of backed off a little bit but there was a man in the crowd that became so mad at what this priest this missionary had done that he attacked him violently so violently that he fell and cracked his skull he was not looking good he was bleeding out of his ears he had a cracked skull he was he was in and out of consciousness he couldn't really think he wasn't coherent in his speech they had to air flight him out of the country to get him medical help along the way it was about a two-week touch-and-go situation and I'm thankful today that he's okay and that he's, he's getting the help that he needs, but he's not where he was before. And all of that because he prayed with somebody and talked to them about Jesus. That's in Mexico. 
Did you know that in Nigeria right now, in the last 12 years or so, there's been over 50,000 Christians that have lost their life for being a Christian? In China right now, if you're a Christian there and you try to attend some sort of underground church, it's very hard. Very hard. They're really cracking down. They're actually rewarding neighbors to call in Christians so they can try to get them out of the country. Would you say with me that in America we have it pretty good? Now, I share all that with you, number one, so that you get the feel of perhaps what it was like for these young Christians in Thessalonica that were experiencing these difficulties of persecution. And they had these questions of why. And secondly, I share that with you because we ought to be praying for Christians all around the world praying for them and their safety and their tenacity and their passion that the gospel will reign supreme so the persecutors were hassling the church it was enough to get anybody discouraged this young christian church their heads were perhaps a little hung low and their knees were a little feeble with the with the issues and the trials and they were wondering why god why these outsiders are hurting us but there was another group and in verse four he not only mentions persecutions but he also mentions tribulations And under tribulations, I kind of place two groups here, two groups of people that were disturbing their peace. The word tribulation means to be pressed or to be stressed ever. You ever been stressed out? I mean, just stressed out. Have you ever had stress for the right reasons? Man, I'm just stressed because of what this is. These young Christians were being persecuted from the outside and they were being hassled and stressed from the inside. This second group, I would call false teachers that were hassling these Christians. And Paul writes a lot about false teachers through his letters because every time he would give the gospel, there would be a group of people that would try to infiltrate the church to sway them from the truth that Jesus is enough, that only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There was always false teachers that were trying to infiltrate these churches here. So Paul would write to them a lot. And it seems that in the interim, between the first and second letters that Paul would write, something has happened that has, that has caused them anxiety or stress. And what they have heard, remember in the first letter, Paul talked about the coming of Jesus. Paul talked about the rapture uh, that, that will occur for the saints. And he spoke about the day of the Lord coming upon them and the judgment that would follow. And it seems that in the meantime, either there was a forged document of something that people said Paul wrote, or there was some sermon or teaching that these young Christians had heard, preached or taught, that said that the day of the Lord had already come. And it scared them. Paul said it was in the future, and then now they're hearing it's already come, and Paul is going to deal with this in chapter 2 of this book. As a matter of fact, I'll show you verse 1. Now now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. By the way, that's where the whole theme of the book came from for me. Unshaken. These people were shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter. As from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. It seems that there were some deceivers within the church then, and then there was actually a third group as well. And really, these were moochers. These were busybodies. They were within this church. Chapter 3 is devoted to actually looking at, it, looking at this and dealing with this topic. But look at chapter 3 and verse 11. It says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. So this whole teaching that the day of Christ had already come on the one hand made people fret and worry, but on the other hand, it created a group of people within the church who said, wow, well, I'm just going to sit back and not do anything then. I mean, what's the purpose? If Jesus has already had this, I mean, he's already come. I might as well just sit back, do nothing other than just meddle in people's business. And so three groups of people, you had these outsiders, these persecutors, you had the false teachers within, and then you had these busybodies. Now, we're going to really look closely at each of these groups as we move on throughout this letter, but suffice it to say that I believe this is a picture of the typical Christian life. We have some good. We have some bad. And there are groups of people, perhaps, that are very growing and very loving as a church, and we're trying to develop that here at at Hillcrest, but at the same time, perhaps you have been hassled. Perhaps you are hearing false teaching from without. Perhaps there are busybodies that try to infiltrate the ranks, if you will. And if you're a growing church or you're a growing individual in the Lord, beware, the inevitable will happen because you are a target of the enemy. You said, Pastor, that's not very encouraging. It's truth, my friend. 
You see, you can expect, therefore, persecutions to come your way because the devil wants to extinguish the light that you have quickly and very early on. As Christians, we're called to be reflectors of Jesus, the light within, right? And the devil wants to hamper that light. He wants to stop you right in your tracks and say, no, you're not going to be a testimony of God's grace to these people. But I'm so thankful that Paul didn't stop here in his thought to them. So we see their, their, their difficulties here. But look at number three. Look at their dedication. Let's look at verse four again. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Their development and their difficulties were met with their dedication. And that's really the focus and emphasis of this letter. And especially the section that these young believers, though they were growing and they were being persecuted and they were being harassed by false teachers and busybodies within, they had met the opposition with the right stuff. Now notice with me in verse four again, there's a different emphasis. What these Christians, what were they demonstrating? Notice those words, patience, which means to endure under pressure, to not give up, faith, to not give up, Here's a group of believers that leaned hard and trusted and kept at it in a daily grind when there was no immediate payoff. No immediate gratification. They just said, we're gonna stick with it. We're gonna do it. It's always right to do the right thing. Now, it's as if they made this decision long ago. And here it is. I know it's tough, I know it's hard, but I'm going to put up with it. And not only will I put up with it, I will follow Jesus Christ so tenaciously that even if things go bad, I'll never give up. Not only will I believe when it's sunny outside, but I will also believe when the storms come. And whenever you make that decision, whenever you have that endurance attitude, whenever you recognize that even in the eye of the storm, you can look to Jesus and he can give you peace during difficult times. I'm going to follow Christ no matter what is before me. You know what happens? It always defeats the devil's plans. You see, the devil's trying to discourage you. But whenever you decide to lean harder, trust more fervently in God, you defeat the devil and what he's trying to accomplish in your life. Say, pastor, show me that in scripture. I'm glad you asked. First Peter chapter four. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Now, I don't know about you. When I'm in trial and hard times, I'm not thinking joy, right? I'm thinking maybe endurance. I'm thinking of just surviving. I'm thinking of, Lord, how, how do I get out of the storm, right? Here he is. But rejoice, and as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you, and their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Lord, I give you glory through my suffering. First Peter 5, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Look, you resist the devil's plans by casting your cares and trusting more fervently on Jesus by enduring, by sticking it out, by making that decision by God's grace. I'm gonna keep following Jesus no matter what. God blesses that. I heard of a Christian who suffered an explosion that caused severe facial disfigurement. And it was so bad that he became blind in both of his eyes, lost both of his hands. He was a young Christian when all of this happened. And it so discouraged and deflated him, being a young Christian, the thing that really disappointed him the most is that he couldn't read his Bible any longer. Couldn't read it. And he wanted to read it for himself. He then heard of a woman in England who learned to read the Bible in in Braille with her lips. So he sent for some books of the Bible in Braille and he put those raised figures up to his lips and he became even more discouraged. 
because he realized that because of the explosion, he had, it had caused so much damage to the nerve endings in his lips that he couldn't feel it. But when he's about to give up, he noticed as his tongue went across the braille that he could feel it with his tongue. And he began to take that Bible and learn braille. Somebody would have to hold it up for him or put it on a stand. And he would take his tongue out and he would read the Bible with his tongue. Did you know by the time he died, he had read the Bible cover to cover four times in braille using only his tongue? Would you say that's endurance? That is truly making the best of it. So these young Christians endured. They had patience and perseverance. Now let's look at how the Paul apostle contributed to not only did they have dedication, but also his dedication to them in terms of encouragement. Look at verse 3 again. It says, we are bound to thank God always for you. Look at verse 4. We ourselves glory in you and in the churches of God for your patience and faith. Now there are two types of people, I believe, in this world. There's the type of person who will walk in a room and say, here I am. My kiddos do that sometimes. But then there's the type of person who will walk into a room and say, ah, there you are. I believe Paul was the second one. Think about what he's doing here. Paul is mentioning this, this stuff, this hard time. Paul would come into this and he would see what they're going through and he would begin to look at their situation and it was marked by discomfort and, and pain and he was able to take that and help lift them back up. Don't you just love that people can do that for you? They put wind in your sails. That's what Paul was. He says, man, I thank God for you. In fact, I am using your example in hard times. I am bragging about the kind of endurance that you have to all of the churches that I visit. Your dedication, your maturity is such a good example of what it means to be a Christian. And isn't that great? What an encouragement you are to me and to others. Man, Paul was a great affirmer, isn't he? Paul mentions the bad stuff. Paul mentions tribulation and persecution, but I want you to get this. He doesn't dwell on it. He dwells rather on the character that they had during the midst of it. And he encourages it to continue to come out of them. You see, Paul was never a pessimist. Paul was a realist, but he was really an optimist in a lot of ways. You read his letters, and have you noticed that in almost every letter he writes, he begins by thanking God for something. <laughs> he, he notices something about those Christians building them up in the faith, and there's a sense of joy, praise, and thanksgiving. You say, well, that's easy to, to, to do that when, when other people are suffering, but not you. Well, if you've studied the life of Paul, I think he went through a little bit of suffering, didn't he? As a matter of fact, he wrote a book called Philippians, and Philippians was written from when he's under house arrest in Rome for a crime he didn't commit. He couldn't go. He was chained to Roman centurions on six-hour rotations for over two years. Couldn't go anywhere, couldn't blaze a new trail or anything like that. And he's writing about the suffering that he had been through. And in that book, when he was in immense suffering himself, he writes about joy and rejoicing more than any other book he wrote. See, there's more joy and more thankfulness and thanksgiving in that letter than any other. And Paul could come into a situation where these people were so discouraged. They were so hurt. They were so wounded. They were carrying this weight upon them. And he could say, look, I know you're going through something. I know there's persecutions. I know there's tribulations. I know there's a true condition here. And yet he can cause them to feel a sense of joy that they had as young Christians in Christ, all because he focused on encouraging them. You know, spiritual encouragement is a key to helping others hang tough and to help others hang tough in bad times. I thank God for you, and I ought to thank God. It's fitting because you endure and you still have faith. And Paul did that. What can you expect as a Christian? Well, you can expect a mixture of the good and the bad. And prayerfully, you're growing and you're increasing. You're loving more and more, not less and less. You haven't allowed yourself to plateau. You're not stagnating. So what's the right stuff? What's something that we should do? What was their dedication in? They had endurance and they had encouragement for others. Endurance for the cause, encouragement to love others. I may not know what you are going through right now, but I do know this. God loves you. We say that a lot in church and sometimes it can feel cliche, but think about the God of all creation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, knows your name, knows you, and he loves you. God has a purpose for your life. 
And God desires for you to lean on him during difficult times. So my friends, this morning, can we say with true honesty this morning that we are growing in our faith in Jesus and our love for others? Are we really growing? Are we stagnant? Have we regressed? Can we say that we are handling our difficulties with patience and faith, that God is in control? And while we may not know the why of our struggles, I'm not sure I understand. Siri never does. <laughs> we may not know the why of our struggles. God is teaching us what he wants us to learn through them. And perhaps he's even showing you somebody who you can help because of them. You know, when we get into difficult times, and I'm done, when we get into difficult times, we tend to ask the question, why, don't we? Why, Lord? Why this? Why that? By the way, God's not afraid of that question. God's not afraid of that question. Why? But I think as we mature, we start to think of two other questions that might be actually more important. And here it is. What are you trying to teach me? Now, why is this happening? What are you trying to teach me? And maybe the second question is, who are you wanting me to help? Don't waste a struggle. Don't waste a difficulty. Don't waste a valley. When you go through those hard moments, God calls us as maturing Christians to make the best of it, not in our own power, but because he is there. He is in control, and he will guide you through the storm.